Bradford, who's director at Slick Sports Consultancy, and she's going to be sharing um, a personal story on her own experiences of coping with and managing with alcohol addiction. And what we're going to do is delve into the psychological impact um, of that and taboo and stigma, particularly around our communities and um, and also how, as a female, how she must have, you know, how she felt and how, how she might have been perceived. Any questions, could they please go into Sabrina and Vina? So just for those of you who were with us um, last month, um, we'll follow a similar, a similar process in the sense of we'll have um, an opportunity to open the platform and have a Q&A with those who are um, attending. I will hand you over to Sonia, who um, will share her story. Okay, so um, unfortunately it's a little bit difficult for me to hear you guys, so I apologise in advance. Um, I've really tried my best to kind of like, I'm so glad we've actually able, at least able to do it. So we'll make the best of what we have. Um, just obviously starting with um, the beginning of probably my journey. Uh, God, where do I start? Hey? And I hope you guys are able to hear me. If you can't, just shout a little bit louder because there obviously is I'm outside and, um, you know, I'm lucky enough for them to give me internet access. So I'm, I'm grateful for that because the train was obviously standstill. Manisha knows the journey, so I don't want to keep going on about that. Um, with my particular journey obviously I suffered from alcohol addiction from the age of 23 I'd probably say very young I'm 38 now so probably about over 15 16 years uh, it was a very difficult time for me I mean to to begin with I just thought it was something normal really that you know you kind of go to uni you've left school you go out with your friends you have a drink and you know that's that's supposed to be something normal but I realised as kind of time went on, it wasn't actually really normal what I was doing. And I think the worst thing is that deep down inside, I kind of knew that it wasn't right, but I just thought, oh, okay, this is a stage. It's almost like being in denial, isn't it? When we're young, where, you know, especially in the Asian community as well, I think because we were so restricted where we weren't allowed to have boyfriends, not allowed to have makeup. I'm talking about my generation, so if there's anyone that is younger that's actually joined in, it's uh, not me being kind of disregarding your generation at all. It's just a hell of a lot different uh, from my time growing up. And that's just my personal experience. I'm not saying that everyone's experience was the same, but it was very much like you went to school, you know, you did your GCSEs, you did your A-levels, you know, you went on to university if you wanted to. I think there were a couple of people in my year that were kind of like, if you got a good job and you were lucky enough to get a good job that paid well, your parents would probably be okay with that. But it was very much a very kind of, you know, a structured kind of procedure when we were growing up. So for me, it was almost like I was always that type of girl. And then, you know, I ended up in a long-term relationship at a very young age. Nothing bad or nothing negative to say about that particular person, to be perfectly honest with you. He's a great guy, and I will still stand by that. But unfortunately, his family were just not very acceptive of me. Um, and when we when we split, I just ended up very bad on the drink. Again, thought, thought it was a phase, you know, being a young girl, going from teenage years into kind of like your young adult years, and it just really didn't, just didn't end up being like that. Um, and it kind of carried on into my 30s and prior to that obviously I'm kind of skipping parts um, and the only reason why I am doing that is not on purpose or to rush anything is actually because I have been told by my documentary producers is not to reveal too much information which like if we had done this which was scheduled in um, obviously last month I would have been able to have been a bit more open but I have been told to kind of hold back on a few things which I totally understand from uh, my director and my producer. But yeah, I just thought, yeah, this is just a normal thing. You get over someone, you're in a long-term relationship, being at a young age, it's your first love, your second love, whatever it is. And I just did not get over it, really. And um, yeah, I was drinking from like, say, seven o'clock in the morning till whenever. Um, yeah, it was just, uh, I'd love to say it was a blur, but even talking about it, I can still remember those days, you know. Um, I couldn't hold the job down. I didn't even feel like getting up in the morning, didn't brush my teeth, didn't brush my hair. 
it was just yeah it was a very difficult time in my life and I just thought that what initially like I said I thought that was a phase and it's something I think I need to I think it's something I need to kind of like put more emphasis on because I think sometimes we think that when we go through tough times it's just a phase we're going through but if something carries on for that long it's not really a phase anymore is it it there you know there is there is an issue there and there is a problem and we need to address that and the first people that have to address that is we me or yourself that individual has to address that so yeah it carried on for a long time um up until the age of 30 obviously I feel like I'm repeating myself because I'm like trying to it's difficult for me to get the message out there because I do get a little bit emotional sometimes when I talk about what I went through I, I, I know there's a couple of things I can't really mention J just probably because I actually find it quite difficult to talk about those two particular things but that's actually the first time I've actually said that so there must be something about having all these women here like on this platform that I obviously feel quite comfortable actually admitting that to. Yeah. But yeah, over the years, I, you know, I, I, you know, everyone thinks that when you've gone through addiction and being an Asian woman and, you know, struggling with what you've had to struggle, you can't be successful, but you can. And then you have this pressure of if you're at a certain age, you're not married, you don't have children. And that was very much expected from my generation. I don't know whether that's the same for, for all of you and whether you are settled down, but that was very much accepted from, you know, that, that was what was expected from my generation was to be settled down, have children. And it just didn't happen for me, you know. Who the hell would want to marry someone that was coming home drunk and, you know, crying to their parents and asking my dad to save me? And it was, yeah, it was just, just absolutely awful, to be honest with you. I am finding it a little bit difficult, guys. I'm going to have to be honest with you. So, yeah, does anybody want to say anything? Um, yeah, so um, obviously, you know, we mentioned on, on the flyer, Sonia, um, we put a few different uh, key issues on there. Um, mm -hmm. One of them being, um, you know, family expectations and responsibilities. I know you mentioned it um, in, in, in your intro just. Um, but what kind of pressures did you feel from your family, you know, growing up and how did that affect you? Did that sort of le lead into the alcoholism or did that have any effect on that? I think it was more so when I was younger and obviously coming out of school, I did my A-levels. Um, I actually got kicked out of school. Uh, so I had to do my last year of my A-levels in adult education. So again, the pressure was always there from that point because it was like I had to pass my A-levels, I had to go to university, I had to do a degree and then obviously end up meeting someone or getting introduced to someone to end up getting married. But unfortunately that plan didn't work out the way my parents or my family wanted at that time. So um, the pressure is always, the pressure still to this day is very immense. And I'm not saying that my parents or my family are putting that particular pressure on me, but I'd say back in, Back in that time when I was growing up, I felt immense pressure, you know, to to be this this type of woman in in terms of not just what my family or my parents expected, but the Asian community as well. It's like, okay, I made a couple of mistakes, I got myself back on the right track, so now I need to move forward. I've gone to uni, I've got to get married, I've got to have kids by the age of 24, 25. I still feel that same pressure. You know, obviously going through what I did go through during that time still has that effect on me now because nothing has really changed. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely. I haven't got married, I haven't settled down, and I still haven't had those children. So therefore my, my parents are not grandparents or, you know, what was I felt at that time was expected of me. Do you think, I know a lot of, you know, we say all these things that we need to have this done by a certain age, you know, um, you know, a lot of it does come from the outside community, um, but do you feel as though you sometimes you put those own pressures on yourself and you just feel as though you need to have those things done in life? Um, yeah, absolutely, because I feel like, again, it's not about me going back to generations, but I feel like particular with, you know, particularly with my generation, it was very much, that was kind of what was expected of us. You know, things have changed, we're in 2020 now, but it's still when I look back and I think, well, hold on a minute, 
I should really have been settled down by now. I should really have children and I should really, you know, I, I should be part of the family, my own family. I shouldn't be living at home. I should be living at home with my parents at the age of 38. And I said, that used to really weigh heavily on the back of my mind. But if you want my honest opinion now, it doesn't really weigh that much on my mind now because I realised that everything that I went through, whether that was good or bad, whether the achievements, you know, everything. I have achieved a lot, obviously, over the past 15 years, but I've also gone through a hell of a lot, just like many people have during their own, like, you know, personal circumstances. But, yeah, of course, there's always pressure from the Asian community. Come on, guys, who are we lying to? You know, when I come home, I could be coming home today, late, from having a Zoom meeting with you guys at 8 o'clock. And I still feel like the people that are sitting, or living, sorry, not sitting, it's only because I can see her through her window because the curtains aren't drawn, um, you know, looking through her window and saying, oh, I wonder what she's up to because all her kids are settled down and her kids weren't great. And I'm, I don't need to mention that person because I don't feel that's right to do that. I could be talking about anyone that lives opposite my house. But at the end of the day, I still feel like I have that judgment and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand why in 2020, we still have that judgment. Take away the addiction, take away what I've gone through, what I've suffered, just like how probably all of you women have suffered what you have needed to suffer. I don't feel like I should have to come and walk down my road and still feel conscious of what people are looking at through their windows when I come home, whether that's eight o'clock, seven o'clock, 11 p.m. at night. Does that make sense? Because I still feel like that judgment is there and it has not changed. And I don't care what anyone says, it has not changed. Yeah, I think what's important is... Well, yeah, it'd probably be different. Yeah, I think it, what's important is, you know, you said a good few times, like, I should be doing this, I should be doing that. And I think that's something that we need to sort of um, stop sort of blaming ourselves a little bit because it is, com it is coming from the community. And it's almost like, you, you still feel as though you you should be doing all these things. And even though you don't believe that yourself, you're still saying it to yourself, even that exactly you're that. So, so I thought you've exactly hit it exactly, you know, it's why am I still talking about this stuff? Because clearly it still affects me and clearly I'm still, it's still happening. It's still relevant. That's the difference. It's not a, a talk of the past. I could sit here all day and go on about how, you know, when I used to go out and get drunk and I thought it was normal, but then deep down inside, I knew there was something more to it. But it's still carrying on now, even when I'm talking to you guys and I'll jump on the train when I finished because obviously the train was delayed. But anyway, I keep mentioning that, but I just trying to make myself seem a bit better about it being delayed. Um, you know, and I still know, it doesn't matter what time I get home, I'm always, I, I struggle to like understand why the hell am I still living down a road with those same particular people? that are making me feel like I'm a bad person because I've come home late because I'm actually having a wonderful conversation with you guys tonight. Or I've been reporting on the boxing or one of my fighters that I work with is actually fighting at your pool tonight. Just giving you a few examples, but every time I still feel like, you know, they, they make me feel like, oh no, I've got something to, to hide or prove. And that's the God's honest truth. And I don't feel like at the age of 38, I should be feeling like that. And I don't think anybody should still be feeling like that. And that's why it's important to have these conversations because it's still continuous. It's not like it's left me. Can I, um, can I ask Sonia, what, what was it like um, for you, you know, um, when, when you were going through that whole process and, were, were comments made? Did, did people make you feel that, you know, did people belittle you? Did people make you feel that, you know, um, that, that you were worthless? What was it, and, and as an Asian female, what was that like? I, initially, I just, like I said, I thought it was just a stage that I was going through. And then obviously it carried on. And then there was people that were approaching my parents on the street. This is, I'm, I'm talking about when I was like 23, 24, when it first kind of started. And they would just say, yeah, your daughter was in a bit of a mess last night. We could hear her. Because I was always shouting and just arguing with someone and somebody could hear it. And then I think the real big thing for me is when I had letters delivered to my house, which I've still got now, which is actually quite nice because I look back on them and I think, oh, okay. I might not be perfect, but I've definitely progressed a hell of a lot further. And they actually asked my parents and um, myself and my family to move from Heston because I was bringing shame on them. 
and I didn't initially know about those letters until a few years later but obviously that's just a that's a different kind of situation but in terms of what I felt like going through what I kind of was going through because at the time I didn't really know what it was but I knew there was an issue like deep down inside I knew there was something wrong I felt ashamed of even walking to the shop like buying a newspaper I'm old school so I still buy the newspaper to this day like I don't read like the newspaper online I'm very old school like that and I just used to think oh no they're looking at me or you know, if I walk down the street someone's going to recognize me and the worst thing is is when you suffer from alcohol addiction a lot of that times you have blackouts so you don't remember if you actually spoke to someone because I've had that happen to me so many times where someone's approached me and they said I saw you last night and I'm like I have absolutely no recollection of speaking to you at all and that's the scariest thing so for me and even to this day I'm sorry to say I do not feel like that judgment has changed because what I went through over 15 years ago yeah it was bad and I was young and I was naive and I still was quite clued on to their, their kind of reaction, their perception or their acceptance of me. But still to this day, I still feel like they're very much the same. And there has not been a change and a change needs to be made. That how do we make that change? Do you think it's worse being an, a South Asian woman? Or do you think it's, um, it, it's, it's challenging anyway? That's a really good question actually, because obviously going through you know this whole lockdown and stuff i've obviously met some amazing people i've spoken to so many great people but i actually do you know what i actually feel like it's a very big issue amongst south asian amongst the asian community in general and i have seen a slight change but i tell you why the only reason why i've seen a slight change is my family they've shown me change with the way that they've accepted me the way they have turned around and supported me but then when I speak to other people, I'm not really seeing the, you know, the same thing. So has it really changed? Sonia, Sonia I've got a question for you. What, what do you think um, can be done to kind of help change that? Um, I suppose that um, is a mindset or that interpretation that we have or that we, we have in our community, if you like. What do you think can be done to kind of change people's perception? Of in it? terms of me as an individual or in terms of generic or... Um, just generic, g generic, um, or what do you think we can do in communities as such to kind of change that thing? I think we need more women to speak up. You know, I can't be the only one. And don't get me wrong, I've like, you know, I was quite proud a couple of years ago because in 2018 I saw like some really great articles on the BBC website, um, mainly from like. No, 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 I'm all right, thank you. Um, he's just come over to me and asked me if I want a drink. Hypothetical. Um, no, so from 2018, when um, I was reading, like doing some research and stuff, and I saw on the BBC website that uh, there was a couple of people that had spoken up about their partners having an alcohol issue, but it was women speaking about men. So I saw one um, article, which I've actually spoken about. I spoke about it on ZTV in 2018 because it caught my eye. And it was a girl that went by a different name. And that's 2018 girls or guys, if any, if any guys have obviously joined into this conversation. And for me, I'm kind of like, still in 2018, a woman still feels that she has to hide her identity to admit that she had a, you know, an addiction issue because she wants to protect her family. I spent 15 years protecting my family. Does that make sense? And that's 2018, we're only two years down the line. So for me, all I can say is that I just have to continue to raise as much awareness as I can. I've got um, a feature coming out on Thursday, which is going to be shared on, you know, all like social media platforms in that, you know, in connection with that particular foundation. I've also got a documentary coming out. I am not going to hold back. And I know that eventually my voice will lead on to other people being able to say, well, do you know what? This is my real name. My name, I'm not going by the name of. This is my real name. Be proud of who you are, be proud of what you've gone through, be proud of the struggles and continue to share them. We need to continue to have these conversations and not just like this, guys. You know, it can't just be like, oh, yeah, we're speaking about alcohol addiction this week and then mental health next week. These conversations need to continue and continue and continue. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, you mentioned, Sonia, um, you said, you know, you tried to get your family to like move away from your area. 
And I think, you know, sometimes within our community, we, we tend to think we need to move away and remove ourselves just to, to fix issues. And it's not even fixing an issue, it's running away from an issue. Um, and I think what we need to sort of get towards is trying to still be part of our communities, regardless of what we've been through and regardless of our past. And that's the most important thing is we have people like you speaking out so other people feel comfortable to share their stories as well. Um, so, you know, we spoke about it on our last webinar about breaking the stigma. Um, the only way we can break the stigma is by having these conversations with each other. Well, we need to continue this conversation though, girls, boys, lads, or whoever's like joined in. These conversations need to continue. Um, you know, it's, I couldn't speak about what I went through. You know, and one of the biggest reasons why I didn't, I held it in for 15 years is because I needed to protect my family. And I was so nervous when I went on TV for the first time two years ago, because I thought, bloody hell, what is this really going to do? Am I going to get a backlash here? Because there's always negativity, especially more so with social media. You don't know who's on your side or who's not on your side. But Joe, you know what? I'm, I'm so glad I did it, you know, because someone had to do it. Because now it's going to open doors. Now, I honestly believe, give it a few years, more people, more, especially more women, will start speaking about this type of thing. And we need that. We need things like this for me to come on. Because every time I talk about it, I get more confident. I mean, Manisha's known me a long time. But, you know, I, I come across as confident. But there's, you know, there's certain things I don't really always want to mention. Um, would you say, you know, obviously, you know, the addiction, it may have been caused by a number of different things in your life but would you say that the pressure of the community may have also had an effect and and caused the addiction in a way um or yeah, absolutely i mean there's always pressure isn't there for all of us and and you know what i need to stop talking about oh coming from my generation there's pressure on on people in this generation now there's pressures for everybody but i just felt like at that time because you know i was seen as the good girl at school you know, the one that was supposed to, was supposed to be married by like 24, 25, but that just didn't happen for me. And then when, when it doesn't happen, it, it, it's difficult for you to accept that because that's what everyone expected of you. So it's like living up to other people's, not just your family's expectation, but other people's expectation, even outside of your community. You know, I grew up in a, in a small area, which is Heston, part of like just outside of West London got loads of like Asian people that grew up there so it was incredibly difficult you know it'd be difficult for anybody to grow up around there but yeah I, all, I, I still feel pressure now that hasn't changed but I think my age has helped me to to kind of you know deal with that and I also feel like me talking about what I went through um, and believe me it's not that I meant to leave things out today it's just I can't say everything if that makes sense and I hope you guys understand that um it just makes me feel like every time I speak about it I feel like just a little bit more is being you know taken off my shoulders but yeah it wasn't easy imagine like going home and finding out you had letters delivered to your house telling you to move because your daughter comes home drunk she's falling through the you know the front doorstep she's not married she doesn't have kids and that's a community I'm not talking about my family my family had to shoulder, you know, shoulder a lot of the, the responsibility and the shame as well. Got a very close relationship with my brother. Imagine how he felt when he had... Can I just buy a drink? Because we've got a few people yeah. on the other side yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. I'll be, can I just get a Coke, please? A Coke, yeah. yeah thank you. Um, imagine how that would have felt with, say, for instance, I don't know, his friends used to call him up and say that, you know, oh, we saw your sister in the car when she was drunk. You know... They went, they suffered as well, so it's just pretty much one of those things. Um, another thing, I don't really like to say it like that, but no, no, that's just, fine. yeah, it is, it's pretty much just one of those things, really. No, you're sharing your, your own experience, and that's all it, that's all it's about. Um, you know, we another thing we mentioned there was um, juggling of values, so a lot of people, um, probably of your generation, will, 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 will feel the same way that where they have to juggle values of their family and then the values of actually growing up here in the UK. So mm -hmm. there's a bit of a contrast there. And I guess some people of, you know, of, of your age as well, they'll probably feel the, pr the pressure of that the most. Um, how would you feel about that? So juggling of your values? 
Um, so growing up here in the UK and then having the values of, of your family. Um, I think it's, for me, if you want my honest opinion, I think I'm still, thank you. Um, Would you mind moving your stuff from that yeah, table? Yeah. Just pick, a, pick one. Yeah, yeah. Can you bring it in? Is that all yeah, right? yeah, that's fine. Yeah, thank I'll, you. Just to I'll grab it in a minute. The yeah, yeah, that's cool. No yeah. problem. Can Guys, can you give me two seconds? Because I need to grab my bag and stuff. It was. In, I had to come outside so I could hear you. That's fine, no problem. Um, just while Sonia's popped out, please feel free to um, put in any, any questions in, in, in the chat. Um, we've already had some comments come through. Um, one again, where it's, you know, in terms of what Sonia's sharing, it, it resonates, especially around how you're perceived Sorry, guys. when it comes to drinking um, or smoking or, or anything um, associated. Sonia, we were just... We were just oh, saying we about the smoking thing. Yeah, that that you know, just um, there's just been comments um, that have been posted in the chat just around um, how some of what you're sharing is resonating um, with them, and particularly mm -hmm. around you know just having a drink to relax or yeah, having a bag as well. I mean, I smoke as well. I don't hide that. My parents know I smoke, but I don't smoke in front of them. Um, can I can I ask them just out of interest? So. Um, how, and especially like being an Asian woman, and, and you're right with what you've shared, and um, you know, just go, go, going back to what, what Sabrina said as well earlier, that it's really important that I think we have these honest conversations because it will be the only way to normalize them. Mm -hmm. because, you know, you've just openly said, well, you know, I also smoke as well, and, and I know that, um, and me being guilty of it, that sometimes. You do, you do, you do kind of feel, you know, if you see somebody who's, who's South Asian and also female and, and having a cigarette, it's, you still almost think, oh, you know, I'm not sure about that. And I'm guilty of that because I, I still, I still do that sometimes. And I, and, and I know, I realize that actually I need to change. Yeah, but my brother does as well. He kind of, he's just like, you know, he's like, oh yeah, I saw some young girls that were smoking like on the middle of the street. And I was like, but I never did that, Nidge, and I still don't do that now. Like, if I'm back in my area, I'll go and hide down the alleyway for fancy a quick puff. But yeah, I smoke, and both my parents know I smoke as well. I don't smoke in front of them uh, out of respect, and hence that's another reason why I won't smoke on the um, on the on the roads and stuff like in public. Because if somebody from like my family's, you know, my mum's generation kind of saw me, I'd feel quite disrespectful. But I I, I still feel like that was something that was that kind of came from my generation. I'm not saying that, again, today's generation not like that, but um, yeah, I'm just, you know what it is? I'm just a westernized Asian woman. I smoke, I've had issues with drink. I will always probably have issues with drink. Um, that's something that every addict needs to admit to themselves. But until you do actually start being a bit honest with yourself, you're not gonna get anywhere. And that's with anything in life. It's not just about addiction. It's not just about smoking a cigarette. It's just with anything, you know, if anything, any underlying problems or issues that you feel that you have, if you don't, you know, approach them and deal with them hands on, they'll come back to haunt you. It's almost, you know, if they always say you've got to heal from your past, right? So sometimes you've got to go back to certain places to heal from those particular situations and if you're not doing that then unfortunately they're going to stay for you for the rest of your life. It almost sounds like a, a bit of a stupid question but I'm going to ask it anyway that do you know when we talk about um, addiction and with you know with, with your story and your journey around alcohol addiction it's how do you know like how do you know it's that and I know like you know it mounts it might be just the obvious of well you do because you're drinking all the time but how it's no similar to you know when we talk about mental health conditions it's mm -hmm. as, a, as a person like how do you know and what helps you come to that conclusion and that awareness of actually there's a problem and I need to I need to do something to help me I think with me I know when I'm getting bad is when I uh, end up going to hotel bars um, I have a habit of doing this when, um, which has happened often as well when I've relapsed, I end up going to hotel bars and I just end up drinking on my own and just talking to anyone. And also blackouts. I suffered a lot from blackouts from, it started happening actually from the end of 2016, right up until probably the end of last year actually. And that's when I knew. 
that there was an issue. Like, and the thing is, what people need to understand is that you can go into a pub and go meet your friends and have a drink or whatever, but it's knowing how much your body can actually take. It's knowing your limit. And with me, it was just like, I literally just ended up going to like anywhere and I just ended up being on my own, having a drink, talking absolutely rubbish to anyone, anyone that would listen to me. And then I'd end up having blackouts. I couldn't remember how I got home. And that's really, really dangerous for a woman. So for me, that's when you know you're, you're um, you know, you're, especially in terms of alcohol, I can't really speak to any other addiction, but that's when you know it's getting out of hand. So if we, if you know where you spoke about um, that's it, it, when it becomes dangerous, mm. um, and this could be in terms of advice, and I know Vina asked um, uh, about well, what can we do as well earlier, that how, so you have to be in a place yourself as a person, don't you, to, to kind of say, do you know what, I acknowledge that, I, that there's a problem and I need to go and seek help because it's now, it's either it's becoming dangerous for you in how you're living your life or a danger to other people. Um, what, what's the next step though? So so let's say you've acknowledged that and maybe like from yours, like, what do you do? Because I'm just, you know, but for us is we want to be able to share um, small clips from this, you know, and, and, and hopefully open up, like you said, or hopefully open up more conversations. What my honest opinion. Yeah. I'm sitting here now in a restaurant straight bar and I've ordered a coat. The old Sonia would have a glass of wine and, you know, it, it wouldn't matter to me. I still do the conversation with you guys. I was very good at hiding it, you know. Um, if you're fa if you can't go to, and honestly, I have to keep saying this: if you cannot go to your family, and they're not going to support you, and they're not going to, they're not going to back you, they're not going to listen to you or understand you, then my next advice would be: is go to your GP, because that's something that I did actually do, and she was fabulous. I'll be honest with you, I didn't go to no AA meetings. There was only one that I actually went to and I was there for like 20 minutes and I just left. But not everyone's like me. You know, you can feel strong and, you know, at some point in your life and you feel weak at another point in your life. But for me, I just generally feel like that if your family is not going to back you or support you, you're going to have to look for that support outside. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because as much as you love your family, as much as you respect them, if they're not down for you and they're not going to support you, this is harsh words for anyone who will have to find that support elsewhere. And yes, there is support elsewhere. And I'll tell you one thing, how amazing and how nice it is to actually speak to somebody that is outside of your circle of friends, that's outside of your, you know, your, your family, that you just feel like you can be your complete self with because you know they don't know you. They're not going to judge you, are they? They're not going to look at you and say, well, I knew you when you were 15 or you are my child. You're going to speak to someone that could actually understand where you're coming from without judgment. And that's the biggest lesson I've learned over the past 15 years. How so many amazing people I've met that were never my friends, they were never my family, but I felt I seeked comfort in them, you know, they really helped me. People that I worked with that weren't my closest friends, they saved my life, you know. In 2012, they saved my life. I wouldn't be here to be speaking about this if it wasn't for those two particular people. They weren't part of my, my life growing up. So does that make sense? It, it, it doesn't always have to be your family need to. If they love you enough, it, they, they'll never stop loving you. But they have to understand, they have to go and educate themselves. If they're not going to listen to you, it's hard when you're a mother or you're a father and you see your child go through that. Does that make sense? It's, it's not easy for anyone to watch their child go through that. It certainly wasn't easy for my parents. And also, I've got a very close relationship with my older brother and my older sister. It was difficult for them. And at the beginning, I was just like, do you know what? If you're not even there for me, I just, I'm not, I'm, I've gone beyond even trying to explain myself. So I just seek help outside with strangers. Sorry, Sonia. You know? And eventually, um, your family do love you. It's not that they do they're not against you, especially with the Asian culture. It's very much like, oh, they think there's a curse on you. So now we need to go to India and get you, you know, there's black magic that's been put on you. Come on, people. Like, I'm talking, I'm, I'm telling the truth now. So, and I was very much like, no, actually, maybe there has been no black magic. Maybe I'm just a person that just went through a tough time and this happened to me and that there was nothing sinister, you know, or religious that was put upon me. 
And I so think yeah, some yeah. parents as well need to understand that. It's about educating them as well. And the, the more, like I said, the more of these conversations, we need to get the older generation involved in these particular conversations. Um, can I just say that my mum wants to make a comment. She said she's been listening downstairs and she's like, Oh no, I sounded awful to say that. <laughs> Hello everyone. Um, it's such a Hi. Hi, very nice to meet you, Sonia. Lovely um, to meet you too. Um, I feel very passionate about everything you're saying and I can really relate to it. Um, I don't know if anyone might be aware through Sabrina, but I have been a victim of alcohol as well. But I've been on the other side of it. Um, my husband was and still is an alcohol, alcoholic and I suffered a lot of domestic violence through my whole marriage of 27 years but the, the impact it had on me even now I still struggle to talk about it and the whole thing about our culture is very very huge as an Asian woman you're supposed to stay hidden keep it quiet not talk about it because of the extended family doesn't look right in quotes what will the outside world think of you you know and uh, because of those reasons you do put up with a lot you do sometimes become unaware of what's happening how is it affecting everyone around you as in your own children um it, it can i mean i know you always say there's help out there but it's finding it as well um Myself as an Asian woman, I always used to be scared, where would I start without ruining the family's reputation or letting that... You're starting now. Yeah, letting That's that... That's where you're starting. You know? I mean, I'm, I'm what, 56 now, but I'm talking about 20... You don't lick it, by the way. Oh, bless you. I hope I look as good with the aura <laughs> all my life. <laughs> but um, in those days, I'm talking about when I was 21, 22, right up to the age of 50, I suffered this and I kept it quiet only for one reason, because of our culture or who we are. The Asians, we've, our parents have put us on these pedestals so high that we want to protect them and not burst that bubble, if you know what I mean. And so you'll, you'll keep it covered, keep it hidden. But yeah, you become a vic victim of it. So Do you see what you've just done this evening? Sorry. Do you see what you've just done this evening? Um, well, I've, I've listened to you. spoken in front of all of us. I have been a way to actually well, I've spoken in front of all of us. How courageous is that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very nervous about talking because I've never spoken about it. Isn't, isn't that absolutely amazing? Because you felt like you couldn't speak about that. And you're absolutely right. And that's another issue we don't speak about amongst the Asian community is absolutely. domestic abuse. And that's still... what a woman has suffered at the hands of, or a man as well. We have to take that into consideration. But look what you've just done. Yeah. See what this conversation has done, girls? <laughs> I mean, see what this has done. This has made another woman speak up. This is how important this is. So this needs to continue. Yeah. I mean, there was, there was help for my husband to say, okay, let's go and get you some sort of therapy. But in the Asian culture, it's so cool for an Indian man to be sitting. I mean, it's banter, isn't it? He's always done down the drink. Um, or business is done around and a Johnny Walker and the coke, eh? Hey? Absolutely, mm. it's cool. And if a, a partner or a, hus a husband's wife speaks up, oh, you're under the thumb, you're controlled, all of that kind of typical um, scenarios come into effect. So you basically you're gagged. You're not allowed to say anything. You can't speak up. So you you do become a victim of the alcohol. While they act as if they're the victims, they go for therapy but then they can't see why they're drinking because... But they, they never will because they'll, all be, they'll always be living in denial, just like yeah. how I was. Absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm not going to um, excuse them when I was doing exactly the same. But they always find an excuse for the drinking. It's not them. It's because of circumstances or something else that causes them to have a drink. And then for that drink, it's a knock-on effect, if you know what I mean, how it affects the outside world or the loved ones around them. And with our Asian culture, it's very easy to brush that all under the carpet, but not actually... Yeah, because they see that as a normal thing when it comes to the men, yeah. don't they? They see that as a normal thing. So, just but you need to understand what you've just done this evening. You've come and joined with your daughter, and you've spoken about what you've gone through. 
yeah, because I do feel as if my so age... You need to give yourself a little pat on the back. I feel we should give her a round of applause here because she's come on. <laughs> well try. done. But I, I mean, I admire your strength and how you're speaking to say, well, I wish I had that strength at the time. Maybe if I'd done things differently and had a, I'd say a platform or a support around me where I could go and speak up. For other ladies because believe me my generation there's a lot of moms and wives that are going through exactly the same and they're exactly keeping it all hidden how refreshing it is for us from our generation and then people that are younger to hear you speak like that now because you've actually just inspired me do you see do you see, do you see that that's that's exactly what these conversations are all about yeah. i might not be saying what all the things that I really want to say, but like I have explained at the beginning of this thing, unfortunately I'm not allowed to because of the, my documentary that's coming out, I've been honest about that. And I've been as honest as I can be, you know, it's not that many people that would admit to having letters, you know, delivered through their door. It wasn't easy for me, but it certainly wasn't easy for my family. But you know what, I'm putting everyone else out of the equation here. I know how I felt every day when I couldn't get myself out of bed because I didn't want to get myself out of bed because I didn't want to go outside my house and know that they were all talking about me. Your community doesn't help, so we need to continue these conversations to educate them. And I'm telling you now, eventually we will. We will educate them. And what you've just done, as a mother standing next to your daughter, you've done exactly the same thing. Just what Manisha does every single day, what she's been doing for years, is raising awareness of mental health because of what she's gone through in her own personal experiences. You know, so these conversations, they can't stop. We need to utilise and come together and continue these conversations, whether that's not just alcohol addiction, but drug addiction, because that was a big thing amongst the Asian community as well, heroin. A lot of people I grew up with, they got really bad on heroin. They were Asian kids. So we need to continue these conversations. I'm trying to like look at all of you, but I feel like my face is looking at the window in the restaurant. So I'm just like, hi. And they're just like looking at me thinking, who is she looking at? I've got the coke here. Bloody hell. Right. I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> they are kind of looking at me, guys. So I think I am going to have to, like, switch off. And I really don't want to, but I've got, like, a couple sitting next to me as well. So I don't know. I'm just grateful they let me have the place to, like, do this. That's fine, Sonia. It's, do you know, um, I, I don't even know what to say because, you know, like, Sabrina, you know, for your mum, like, how... That is, it, it's so courageous because that takes a lot of bravery to... Yeah, but to... so is what you've done, Manisha. You know, I always said that when we have this conversation today, I'm not, this is not just about me. This is about collectively, there's always been, back in the day, there was always competitiveness, wasn't there, amongst women. You know, there wasn't us supporting each other. I mean, I had a tag today where I'm supposed to post a picture of myself, women empower women. I don't need to do that because I'm with a bunch of empowering women today on this. If they want to join, if they wanted to join the conversation, they could have done, couldn't they? So for me, it's different aspects. I'm at that age now where I'm like, I've met some wonderful people tonight and you give me the opportunity to share my story. And unfortunately it may have come across in like bits and parts, but there's nothing I can really do about that when you're under contract. I wish I could have just let it, you know, all out, but Honestly, deep down the side, like I have to hold my emotions in, you know, and more than anything, I'm in a, in a restaurant bar now, I could go straight to the bar. When they came out and said, do you want a drink? I could have been like, just get me a wine on the sly, you know? I could have done, that's what I used to do back in the day. It's to hide it from all my friends and my family. But now I'm just like, I'm not gonna get anywhere in my life. I know what's wrong for me. I know it doesn't do anything good for me. I get upset, I get suicidal thoughts. I. I can't, I'm not going to be able to run a business. I've won awards. Manisha's won awards. I'm sure all of you girls have won awards and you're up for getting awards because it's going to happen. We're too old to like, you know, there comes a point where enough is enough, isn't it? Can't hurt ourselves anymore. There's no one else. People can hurt you your whole lives, but you're the ones that are hurting yourselves. You have to admit that there is a problem. And until you do that, you're not going to get anywhere. That's all I can say. Yeah, that's living in denial. What you've just said there about it, um, and I think that's probably a, a great way for us to also close um, this this conversation was around 
acknowledging it and, and becoming self-aware because until, until that happens, it's really difficult to, to go and seek help. And then for the people around it, just like, you know, like Sabrina's mum has spoken about that it, everyone's affected by it. And we've all got our own experiences um, of that where it's, you know, it may not directly be you that's going through a certain um, thing or, or problem or whatever it might be. But by, by the mere fact of, I don't know whether it's a husband, wife, brother or sister, you're directly impacted. You know, your life changes as a result of that. And you can try everything possible to try and help because, you know, you care and you love them. But unless they acknowledge that they have a problem themselves, you're so limited and, and you're almost like powerless on what you can do. But I just, you know, it, it's like what you say, what are these forums for? For your mind. You control yeah. your mind. Your mind is the most powerful tool that you have in your body. So for me, it's like, do I get up and when I, when I go out with friends, how many drinks can I manage? Can I manage like what I used to thinking that there was nothing wrong? You know, it's, you have to, it's all about honesty with yourself. And until people start realizing that it doesn't matter what race or what color or what gender you are, you have to understand that you have to admit that yourself. And that's the best advice I give to anyone because until you acknowledge you have a problem or there was issues, like you just spoke about what you went through with your husband. Manisha speaks very openly what she's gone through in terms of, you know, her personal issues with her family and looking after her brother. I don't know too much about you, V, but I'm looking forward to learning a hell of a lot more. But, you know, it's all about having these conversations and they will lead on to something more positive. I'm telling you, we are going to change the world, girls. And that's why I'm going to have to end up because they keep giving me dead <laughs> I'm going to get into a black no. yeah, detention in the minute. <laughs> that's a great. You how big my nose was. Apologies. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, it's massive. No, it's a, that's you know. Um, I think for us, we're all coming away just feeling so inspired, and um, you know, it, it takes a lot. inspire me. It's not. I'm just grateful that I've been given another platform to to share what I can. You know. Um, and also like the promotion and the work that you girls have put into this like everybody should get behind it so let's continue the conversations yeah definitely thank you Sonia and Sabrina's mum and um, thank you for Lovely everybody meeting all of you apologies for like me being late it's actually Manisha knows me actually I'm always bloody scary so yeah it makes sense anyway I take care thanks Sonia See you later thank you. bye bye how do I come out of this? Ooh. The leave. There should be a leave button. Um, thank you, uh, everybody who, who also attended and was listening in. Um, we again. will be back again next month with our, with with our um, uh, with another webinar. But actually, we're we're doing a double this um, a, a double where in August we not only have our regular mental health webinar at the end of the month we've actually also got a women in football webinar to support asian heritage month so we'll be um in the next week or so we'll be sending out some information through our social media outlets on that but thank you thank you all for attending and we hope to see you again next month bye everyone bye bye Suki. Right, it's just us guys on there now. Is it just us? Yeah, stop recording. <laughs>